and we live and this is conversation community hangout on air um, particular theme for this send is um, screen storming and the short explanation for that is facilitated uh, learning conversations uh, First, before I sort of delve deeper into that, I will just sort of a round of, of hellos and introductions. I'm, I'm John Keldon. I'm founder of Conversation Community, which is now 500 people strong. Uh, There's an endless source of delight and conversations for me, and hopefully for a few of the other members as well. A uh, couple of projects that are already underway, which is nice, sort of just kind of beyond just conversations, so to speak. Um, well, small to say. I've been recently having a chat with, with uh, Brandon and also with uh, Griswold. Mark, this is the first time you you and I have met. So, um, without further ado, uh, would you guys want to sort of just say a few words about yourselves? Uh, introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, I'll go. Um, so, a big part of my background is basically. Uh, not liking school and being interested in other ways to learn outside of uh, school and uh, and uh, even at a college level, like from from when I was young up up till like other points in my life. And um, I've met quite a few people who feel the same way and are interested in learning in different ways and finding paths out of those sort of traditional so-called factored model environments. Um, so that's part of what I'm sort of interested in facilitating conversations around how to how to help people sort of think differently about how, how they personally go about learning uh, and build their own learning environments and networks, but also how to sort of navigate out of the expectations and uh, structures that are often that people are often. Uh, told or just what you have to do, which are, th are these often stifling sort of 19th and 20th century style learning environments for non-learning environments for a lot of us. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll go. Um, I'm Griswold Grimm. I hang out in the conversation community a lot. And I guess I'm trying to figure out where G plus can take someone who wants to be taken someplace. And uh, I'm seeing where it can go, and I think the conversation community has so much potential to lead us to make the connections I need to find somewhere where I can be of service, I guess. And I'm Mark Poole. I'm in uh, North Carolina in America, and I work with cabinet makers as a profession. Um, I support them with software and techniques around building cabinets and I sell products to them so I get to train a lot of these adult cabinet makers which goes back over to where I guess part of my passion today is is looking for a solution to some of the problems with education. Um, I'm married to a middle school principal and I have a 18 year old daughter who started college and, and ended college in about a three month period this year and I have a 14-year-old who is finishing middle school this year. And so the Google Plus is, you know, the, the medium that I have found to be most beneficial when it comes to um, looking for information. And it's rich when it comes to these kind of, uh, abil the ability to have these kind of conversations with people who are like-minded. Hmm. I was very um, pleased to hear that there are kind of four uh, different sort of complementary perspectives. I, I might add to, 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 to your excellent intro, Mark, that I'm still reasonably happy married and, and we have three wonderful kids. They are aged 22, 20 and 15. My 15 year old is learning half of the stuff he's learning from video games rather than from school and, and we are kind of cool with that. It's obviously also a bit troubling. I mean Sweden has where, where we're from and that where I'm still living is 
we sort of prided ourselves of having the best education system in the world, which is now more or less slipping. I mean, Finland has sort of massively overtaken that role as being the number one and having a, uh, a decent education system. Um, the the challenge, well, one of the many challenges I see is that through networks in general and, and as you said, Mark, in, in, in G, Google Plus in, in particular, we are networking almost to a point where we are now beginning to share insights, lessons learned, uh, providing rich context, sharing our stories. So we are kind of all already beyond uh, the offered existing solutions. What, what we still lack is a sufficient level of sort of coordination which would allow for us to uh, design better working solutions in the field, which is why I'm particularly glad you could join this mark. Uh, Griswold uh, represents uh, kind of a different perspective where there's millions upon millions of uh, individual consultants who are at the very forefront of designing and redesigning what consultancy is all about, what value creation and what value co-creation is all about. Augmented and 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 and, and uh, um, uh, amplified by by networks, by actually us sharing stories and insights like this. Um, what also remains is to to translate whatever insights, lessons learned, practices, uh, inventions, formats we can sort of come up with through these platforms, and how to take parts or or the whole of it back to our um, uh, local communities. I mean, this is this is a formidable challenge. I mean, if I would say to my local school principal here in Okop in Sweden that the new thing that is actually really great is social learning, connectivist learning, um, situational leadership, I would at best get a blank stare. <laughs> I mean, but this is kind of how it is, right? I mean, this is kind of the, uh, the rubber meets the road when you when when things I would say, and it, it wouldn't really matter if I would back this up with formidable uh, teacher theses. Some of them would even be written in Swedish. It wouldn't. It would. It still wouldn't matter. So, the the battle. I mean, it's perhaps an unfortunate choice of word, but I mean, the challenge, if you will, is to design, um, you, I, I mean, I'm usually calling them onboarding frameworks, onboarding apps. So I think the, the, the easiest route to effect change is through apps, through smartphones. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not one to give up on people, but I mean, my wife is an is, uh, uh, author teacher in, in, in a K-12 local uh, here in Sweden and let me just say that we have interesting discussions. Uh, I mean she has to play nice within the existing structures. Uh, I mean I could give you an, an, a story for earlier today as, as, as recent as that uh, when she did um, a newsroom uh, exercise with the kids and they loved it, all 25 of them. And then she sent five, six of the brightest, best, the ones who were kind of the, sort of excel at doing kind of these things. They, 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 they did video um, stories on the spot, edited them and, and, and presented and, and, and did a newsroom and it was just a marvelous kind of social, situational, connectivist learning thing, experiential, on the spot. Uh, and she sent him away to the principal, her principal in the, their school, and the principal was horrified because it was such a 
huge break of the conventional things. The, the principle, most principles in Sweden are there for the administrative prowess, prowess not for the, the pedagogical or educational merit. And she's a nice woman, right? There's nothing wrong with her as a, as a person. It's just that when five, six kids stormed in and designed and rigged a kind of an impromptu newsroom right in the middle of the principal's office, it was sort of beyond the normal remit. So she didn't know how to respond. Now, it's anyone's guess why this is so. I mean, the principal could have sort of have a uh, creative fiber beaten out of her as a kid. Who knows? I mean, she turned out a bureaucrat. But this is kind of the situation we're facing where uh, we probably need to figure out kind of different approaches. I mean, smartphones being one, there's possibly many others, but I mean, I'm what I want us to sort of to begin to take a first stab at is what if we could um, uh, leverage our respective competencies, skills, talents, and, and experiences, and pool select parts of that together into what we could tentatively call personal learning environments, and they could sort of then be designed, implemented into uh, smartphones, uh, and. The difference here, as I am kind of envisioning, is that they would be dead simple to to to, to implement. Well, and what I'm talking about when I'm saying dead simple is basically it's four keywords. So they they are repurpose, aggregate, uh, remix, and feed forward. And that's the whole app. Say those again, if you would, John. Yeah, it's the four four verbs, kind of four four activities: repurpose, aggregate. Uh, remix and feed forward. Now, uh, these are basically cribbed from Stephen Downs. So this connectivist theory and, 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 and years and years of experience is behind this. What I've done is I've applied a tool from a completely different field, kind of basically from management and, and consultancy and agencies called design thinking. So I figured out a way to turn those four words as kind of a core um, the core set of functions, if you will, and then you can sort of apply around that a uh, a flowchart, if you will, and the flowchart then serves two functions. One, it allows for all learners, I mean, because this is four keywords, so this is kind of basically for everyone, and then that those flow ch that flowchart would serve two two purposes. One, uh, enabling every learner to hack and mix uh, and modify and turn that little app into their own. So that's kind of the design thinking thing comes in when, when by the very act of making it their own for reasons of motivation uh, and, and for, for pride and for ownership. Sort of, this is my personal learning environment because I sort of built it. I cobbled it together out of these building blocks. The other flow function of the flowchart is that it basically is a flowchart, so it will be fully transparent for all the learners. This is kind of how it's done. And since it's also a flowchart, the pattern underneath the flowchart, the rationale, if you will, would then be transferable to anyone else. So there will be kind of a pr proliferation of different looking uh, uh, personal learning environment because that would sort of suit everyone's different learning style. But underneath it would be um, uh, a sufficiently shared context across all of them, which means that they could actually be built a platform. But the the the, um, the key drivers of what would be happening on the uh, the bigger, the collective platform, if you will, the, 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 the kind of the, the distributed, distributable platform, would be the learner's own um, uh, uh, desires to sort of build it. So you could actually build then a community on top of this. Would be kind of a personal learning environment, online community where people would exchange uh, lessons learned, insights. I've cobbled it together like this. Ah, you didn't like this. Ah, I, I put a green button over here. 
I did it in the reverse order in these two steps and so on and so forth. So that would be kind of the meta conversation that would allow for um, the discourse around it. So it's kind of a building it sort of bottoms up instead of sort of imposing a the perfect learning environment order and structure upon the poor learners. So um, I, mean, I realize that kind of I'm, I'm sort of jumbling all over the steps here. But well, I'm just stop, I'll stop you there. Let me yeah, ask you yeah. a couple of things. It's amazing how your your life experience is sounds like it mirrors mine very much. Yeah. You know, with a, with a spouse that teaches, you have good insights into education. With kids, you have good insight into education. Um, and as you talk about flowcharts, you know, it reminds me a lot of how you have to do things with computers. You have to do things in a specific order with computers, and they just laugh at you. Yeah. And so, you know, a flow chart, we understand that. When you get down into the school-age kids, they would laugh at you if you talked about a flow chart. Yeah. And I think that points out where things are, are going afoul. You are up against a big institution with these schools. They're going to tell you how it's going to be done, and that's going to be the way it is. You're trying to go to the other extreme, which is to say, tell us what you want to learn, child, and we will, you know, stand by and guide you toward what you want to learn. And I think that you can have all these, you know, a flow chart, and you're going to, you're going to be able to describe how it should work in theory, and I think you and I would be on the same page in theory how we want it to work. But where the rubber meets the road and how this thing has to happen is you have to find out what each child wants to learn. And you can't even say it as to what they want to learn because learning is secondary. You have to find their passion. When you find their passion, you allow them to find their one or two or three passions that, you know, at 14 years of age, all the learning will come along on its own. You won't need yeah. teachers and principals and gatekeepers. You don't do that. I'm proof of that. Brendan's proof of that. I don't know your schooling history, but I suspect there's probably some proof, some some truth to that in your own background. That if you find your passion, everything else flows from that. But right now, the problem the kids have is kids don't have time to find their passion. You know, they find it playing games, and that's fun. And for that subset of kids that play games that actually are turned on by programming, they're able to go out here and get involved in programming and make games and build apps and do really cool work with computers. But that's not everybody. I don't know if it's 2% of the population or what subset of the population that is that eventually becomes coders. But those are the ones that start off playing games. And if you listen to success stories from the gaming world, people that are 50 years old today that are successful in the gaming world as a business, you find out they all started playing games back, you know, in the early 80s at the same time I started with computers. And now they're successful in the business world making games or making apps. They found their passion and everything came along for the ride. And I think that that's got to be central to the conversation because I don't see you're going to solve anything or change anything from within the school. The institution is just too big. There's too much momentum in school to change it from within school. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I, I have to agree to all of that, basically. Uh, I mean, case in point, uh, my 15-year-old uh, needed to do a presentation uh, about, um, I think it was biology mostly, DNA molecules and protein and stuff. And I, ju I just pointed him to Prezi, which is kind of a presentation tool, which is sits online. So two days later, he now shows me, because he's just learned it and then he has produced his first Prezi. Two days. So it's it's uh, because for him it's easy because there's no kind of um, there's no one there telling him that this is difficult or this would need a, a course would would take a couple of months no uh, there's so good um, learning material and stuff around the the, the tool itself 
So he basically fired up a couple of Prezi presentations, a couple of YouTube videos, and he's off, right? So this is kind of what... I mean, obviously it's a formidable design challenge, but I mean, I think we could gather a small group of people and basically pull it off. So the personal learning environment would be kind of intentionally not fully done from the start. See, it would need sort of be added on to links towards this or that YouTube video or this or that external, whether it's well, Coursera or what have you, right, or Prezi. Or, so this is what I mean with kind of cobbling together your own kind of thing. Well, one, one key thing to what you said there, this is so different from what you're, you're trying to, I mean, I use the word battle, and that's an unfortunate use of words, but that's what it feels like. You're trying to work with people that everything starts and finishes in nice little packages. And that's so opposite of life. And I mean, you say you have three kids, 22, 20, and 15. It's night and day difference what we have technology with my 14-year-old than what we had four years ago with my 18, what now is 18-year-old. And you're seeing what life is about. It's never finished, and that's part of it. Anything you're talking about doing today forward for education, there's never a finishing point. That's the beauty of it. There is no start and end in learning, and if you, if you think you've learned it all, well, you're just waiting for your funeral. I mean, what else is there to do? You, you, you're not going to go learn anything, and that's what we're battling is a system that says you start in first grade, you finish formal education in 12th grade, and you go for extended education for four more years, and if you want more, then you find a job and you go for some more schooling. That's just, you know, that's not life as we live it today. Everything you learn in school today is basically irrelevant in four or five years because the technology changes. Yeah. yeah. I think I, another uh, side of it, too, um, in terms of developing a personal learning environment is that people tend to have some existing personal learning environments, whether it's informal or not. Um, like if they're on... Google Plus or Facebook or Twitter or forums or YouTube or conversations or whatever in their life in, in person um, or even in in actual classes or something. I mean, people have and on their phones. I mean, people have all kinds of apps and all that. So, how would people's existing participation in in all these kind of media and platforms and apps relate to your idea for a for people kind of putting together a a new well, well, it kind of builds on on what Mark just said that and, and which I think is wise and also very true and, in, and increasingly more and more true the more kind of uh, the, the, the 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 changes are accelerating both technology and social and otherwise I mean the, the, the all this networking through Google plus and what have you is kind of a big social experiment all in its own right which is I see as an opportunity obviously also kind of challenges but mostly an opportunity, and that's the way I see it. So which means that a, a community could sort of be very easily designed to bridge across all these things. So these things that should then be dis challenges, uh, opportunities, uh, need to, to, to ask questions, need to sort of get advice. Uh, and online community is kind of already suited for that. I mean, I, I can give you a short kind of context for what has happened already in the conversation community. I mean, it has been up and running for a year, and there's already kind of what I've been teasing out, 60, 70 patterns, which makes for a vibrant, thriving community, and what makes for good, meaningful conversations already. So this means that parts of that can sort of be translated into another uh, online community which would actually be simpler because now there would be a very strong cohesive um, kind of social object to attract and hold conversations around namely these personal learning environments so it would be two things one it would be kind of a personal learning environment app would be kind of ongoingly would be uh, affecting kind of a design synthesis and, and basically weaving together all the other gazillion apps that are already sitting inside people's smartphones already. So people will begin to sort of make sense of 
all the other apps they have and and learn how to sort of integrate them into something that works for them so the the uh, the, the the smartphone app would basically have two valid propositions one is is uh, uh, an increased sense of empowerment and control and the other valid proposition would be kind of an instant kind of one button connectivity towards the community uh, i've figured out that one very very important pattern oh. if, if not the most important pattern in 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 this this online discourse is basically people have a question, concern, challenge, something that they, they can't just Google and get answers for. So they field out a question, concern or something in the social networks and communities, Google Plus, in the public stream, and someone weighs in in a comment and, and, and helps them further along or, or, or answer or, or give a slightly different perspective. So this is, even though this is uh, almost too simple to even be noticed as a pattern is very very powerful because it's so very very common it's kind of goes to the very our very core as social beings as if someone asks us a question and we find it in our hearts and in our minds to, to be able to answer we typically do so this is kind of the whole core dynamic of how a um, personal learning environment online community could actually be designed and how it could sort of run right so there's three types of people more or less that will sort of make for the, this kind of a meeting place if you will one all the learners two uh, at the beginning some few kind of select key um, sort of connectivist teachers if you will I mean this is kind of a crude name for the, that group but I mean more or less those the third type of people I would see as network influencers mavens I mean people like me who have sort of large numbers of, of followers and we could basically toot our horn to sort of get the word out that this is happening folks this is good stuff spread the word and um, yeah I mean that that's kind of the, the, the basic outline of it and then it just was sort of 10,000 details to, to remain sort of to be ironed out because what Mark says is uh, if we design it to be to Finished right from the outset, we will probably fail. This is not, pro not probably. There's no probably. You will fail. Yeah, uh, this is this is. I mean, it's an, an eminent challenge. I mean, this is where there are a, there there is a hint or two from the software world already, where where kind of is, and I think Harold Jarke also calls his approach in terms of, of informal learning and social learning. In I think he calls himself perpetual beta. As a, as a right. subtitle, right? So it's, it's everything that's alive evolves. Everything yeah, right. living and software is like that now. Microsoft six, seven, eight, nine. Whatever, it's iterative. Life is iterative. So whatever you design, whatever you breathe your energy into and your life into, should be iterative. You should design it to be iterative as well, or you're designing something that's already dead. Yeah. But as you're as you're speaking about as an example an app, I don't I think Google has done us a big favor. And I was listening to your previous hangout you were doing in the past hour, John, and you you asked you know rhetorically the question: Is Google's uh, mission statement "Don't be evil" is it is it a true statement or is it a scam? I'm going to take it that it's true. They I don't do anything but benefit from letting Google know about me. Now, that may change. I have a 20 or 25 year relationship with Microsoft and that's been nothing but 100 percent a positive relationship. I've done nothing but benefit by that relationship. So, I'm going to give Google the benefit of the doubt and say they're working for me. And when you talk about an app, we can do this hangout with a cell phone. We can look at a Google document in real time on a cell phone. I don't think we have to create any app for a phone. It works on an iPhone and it works on Android. Anything that you would want to do can be done right now with Google Pieces on a phone, on a desktop, on a Chromebook. And if people fear that Google might go away, I would say, well, you know, that was what I used to worry about Skype. We used Skype for these same purposes for years. And now Google has gotten better at it than Skype. I still do work like this with Skype. And so I don't fear Google going away or Google being evil. Um, 
but I know that that's not central to the problem. The problem is how to get the kids engaged. And first, it goes right back to that starting point. The kid has to be able to find their passion. Right now, without a real passion or without a vision, this is a better way of stating it, without a vision, you've got division. Now, if you're in the workplace and you've got a leader that can cast a vision, then you can bring everybody along for the ride. But at the same time, if you're in school and you're learning and you're going to school every day, without your own personal vision, your time is divided as many ways as the people that you encounter every day. So if there's seven periods in class, your class is going to be, your day at school is divided seven times. You come home and three classes have homework. Now your afternoon is divided three times by three classes worth of homework. If you have external, you know, if you play sports or if you're in the drama program or if you are on the chess club or you're on the debate club, there goes another hour and a half. And then the kid has no time to find their personal passion. Right, and that gets into a, a, a pattern. I mean, that's the pattern John mentioned of people sort of proposing a, a problem and asking for help. Yeah, them. yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to sort of. Sorry, Brandon. I just want to rope in uh, Andrew. Uh, glad you can oh, join sure. us, Andrew. Uh, if you want to unmute your mic and just say hi and and and, and present yourself. See if you hear me. Yes, me. Or I'm not sure if he hears me. Andrew, is you you still there? You hear me? Not so much. Yeah, cool. If you want to, you could just sort of unmute your your mic and sort of just say hi. And yeah, I think you might not have a mic at all at the moment. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to sort of to to. Okay, not letting you mute. Ah, I'm just going to the benefit for for the recording. This is Andrew Carpenter has joined, and and from previous conversations you, he and I have had in Google Plus, I happen to know that he's has some wonderful smarts and insights how to um, kind of look at these things uh, in terms of uh, getting traction. Uh, patterns that works, patterns that's got to be, be, be very, very meaningful to sort of further develop. Sorry, Brandon, back back to you. You were on to sort of going to say. Um, uh, well, so like on on these school survival forums that I participate in, um, very often people pose the the question of like, how do I deal with this situation where I'm forced to be in all these periods each day and and all that, all that that uh, Mark was talking about, and how can I actually figure out what I want to do and pursue passions and interests when I'm sort of dealing with all of this? And then the the, the result is, um, in a lot of cases, what's needed, or one of the things that's needed, is conversations of some kind um, with parents, with educators, to figure out maybe is there something else that can be done? Can things be done differently than just um, sort of this this focus on things like grades and, and attendance and being in seats and change, change the conversation to talking about what are people actually learning, what's their future going to be, how are they going to figure that out, and that, that sort of thing. Yeah. There's another thing, I mean, this, this might come from sort of out from left field in a way, but I, I think I might be able to sort of weave it in. Uh, there's this thing that is... is sort of very hot and very popular and very kind of au jour, at least in Sweden, and it is something called Bloom's Taxonomy. Now, there might be a way to tweak Bloom's Taxonomy in a way that would allow for any which individual learner's own learning style, and parts of that could then be parts of the efforts I mean, we're in a way talking about metacognition applied to Bloom's taxonomy. It's kind of a hideous combination. But if we could sort of pull that off to basically modularize, break up, and turn it into more of a uh, 
uh, whether we inverted it or we turn it inside out, or we modularize it or we turn it into a kind of value web or in an actual ecology or meaning and value. But once we would, and it would still sort of have some kind of a connection to Bloom's taxonomy, it would allow for all these learners equipped with apps that are kind of mostly destined to, to, to pursue their education and learning outside the systems. They would now be given increasingly a voice so they could begin to tell about their own experiences in a way that would even make some beginning sense to policymakers. I mean, I'm not sure about US if that is sort of too far gone to actually the, there would be any salvageable parts in the institutional failures, but possibly in Sweden and in large parts of Europe that might still be, be possible. I mean, because there are task forces already in Sweden and Finland and Norway and elsewhere that are beginning to look into these things and if not for anything else to sort of at least offer some kind of option sort of to bring sort of the bridge back and there are possibly also some aspects of Bloom's taxonomy that are kind of helpful at least in two aspects one it would allow for kind of a self-pacing of the metacognition applied to, to any other learning activity that goes on. Basically kind of a self-review option. Two, once there would be a kind of sufficiently shared, uh, you could say a learning culture, let's say with these apps and, and, and kind of uh, uh, integrated and, and coordinated and, and lessons learned and shared in these communities, uh, their voices, at least collectively, might make a difference if they would be able to express themselves right. in Let's some kind of structure that, that others would understand. I mean, if, if I, I'm kind of edge and, and, and open-minded enough to realize that my 15-year-old, he's already an expert project manage, manager from having leading his sort of a game guild in, in battling with orcs and whatnot he's doing right, in his games. But most people wouldn't recognize that that is so, that he has that skill. Well, so th this is kind of a difficult I'm, translation I support problem, skill. Right? I, I support skill assessments so that, you know, you can go online, take a test, or go someplace, take a test, and then you have a piece of paper that says you can do something. But I don't know. As far as personal learning environments and I think we're on to something with learning how everybody like there's got to be like what maybe 16 32 different ways people learn so once we figure them all out we can recognize what kind of learner this kid is and then do it that way but I think we have to go around the systems at this point the systems are just wasting people's times I think if everybody who cares about making a change in education helps the homeschool people produce children that were smarter and more hireable than the regular system, then the system would be forced to change by because it's obsolete. Yeah, well, I think there is some of that pressure in, in play already. I mean, quite a few people are homeschooling and unschooling and doing pretty well, but a lot of people are still, despite that, the sort of pressure of that and other types of pressures on the traditional system from top down with the standardized testing and accountability and from those people not being happy in it, um, despite that, like a lot of people are still stuck, like right now, every day, in, you know, in in classrooms and in you know, uh, where where basically conversations can't even occur. And so I think there is a role of you know, parallel to all that um, in doing things outside of systems, pushing forward conversations about these things at higher levels and with administrators and and looking at what might be done with that. Um, and blooms might be a one way to do that. I mean, there's a there's a quite active uh, Google Plus thread uh, from Laura Gibbs that was that she started during this uh, DNLE designing a new learning environment course over a year ago that got revived over the past couple of days, specifically about bloom blooms taxonomy and people's different viewpoints of it about it, and some some like it and use it in their curriculum design, some don't. And but I think facilitating conversations about things like that are, uh, is is one step forward. Like asking, like, are these things useful? What should we do? All those types of things.
Yeah. Uh, Andrew, glad you could join, rejoin us. I mean, I, uh, I can't... Ah, now it's sort of gone. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I had to fix my settings. Uh, feel free to I'm sort of tell the others who, who a little bit of who you are and, and, and yeah. Okay, yeah, um, so I'm from Iowa in the United States. Um, and so I, I've been lurking in the threads for a while now. Um, but I'm quite interested in um, uh, the breakdown of the uh, boundaries of organizations and as well as countries. Uh, but um, basically, social is social is becoming big, social networking and all that. Um, I don't know how many of you have read uh, The Power of Full by John Hegel, uh, but that's a great book that helped me do a lot of these concepts about um, the effect that social networking is starting to have within organizations and between organizations and uh, how cooperation and collaboration is starting to become even more important than just hoarding knowledge within an organization. Uh, knowledge flows um, are becoming more important than just um, keeping the, the, the knowledge uh, wrapped up tightly within within an organization. Um, so that's a very interesting topic in itself. Uh, I've missed a lot of what you guys have been talking about, so um, can someone kind of bring bring me up to speed a little bit on what what we're talking about here today? Yeah, I, I can do. Uh, uh, and I also see uh, Mike Trainer has joined us. Glad to have you here. And and uh, Colin Kilburn has joined us also. I, I I can just do a quick, and you can sort of use to others who have joined kind of just introduce you, yourself better. But I can do a quick see if I can pull it off. Mike Trainum has invaluable insights in terms of. of uh, from his background in, in knowing about uh, a great many uh, languages, this is uh, I think that's gist, the gist of it. And this, this is this is important to understand different languages and different mindsets and different approaches in terms of, of, of designing anything that would be worthwhile and meaningful for any which person who would want to learn. Uh, Mark Poole. Uh, has great insights from kind of hands-on on the field training things and what makes for, for uh, effective uh, approaches. Uh, Griswold Grimm has great insights in terms of, among many other things, uh, network protocols, basically what makes for uh, workable ways to Engage in, 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 in meaningful interactions and conversations online. Uh, Colin Kilburn is uh, a programmer uh, who has, I mean, he and I have found a great many resonance points in a great many things. I, I will sort of let him riff a uh, kind of third run on kind of some of those things. Uh, Brenda Storming and I have sort of connected on and off, uh, not that much, but I mean, in a recent hangout, he and I basically figured out that shouldn't we take a stab at, at actually designing um, uh, learning environments that would make for facilitated conversations, and the facilitated conversations would themselves be a vehicle for for. Uh, for, for learning, uh, and, and 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 Andrew, you and I have been have been participated in a number of threads the last year or so in, in, in Google Plus among a range of different topics. So I I, I will let uh, if you want to go first, my training, and you and Colin Kilburn can introduce yourself also. I will have to uh, see if ah there you go. Okay yeah. Um, hello, sorry. <laughs> I'm a bit new to um, all of this, and I, I uh, didn't click the uh, the uh, accept the agreement button and get online uh, quickly enough. So let me uh, let me catch up a bit. I don't I don't want to waste. Uh, 
I don't want to waste your time. I'd rather uh, 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 listen to you, folk, and then I'll I'll come in as um, as it seems fit. Okay, cool. Glad to have you. Good to be here. Thanks. Colin. Yes, let me get my mic here. Uh, <laughs> uh, good God. Should I press the? Let's see. If I, I'm still learning this thing as I go. Sometimes it comes up this unmute thing, and I have to press it. So yeah, it's not completely intuitive. If I should. No, uh, it's me no. again. There you go. It's there you go. Again. We can hear no, now. It's uh, it's the fat fingers and the little Android screen. Okay. <laughs> I have great fun. I have a little pen somewhere. Anyway, um, yeah, I much enjoyed the conversation community. Um, I've come up uh, with a few conversations with Griswold, and. Uh, Thank him for that as well. And John Kelden, he seems to be quite a, a sage of infinite information about trying to uh, make the world a better place for his grandchildren. I think, uh, as Andrew Carpenter and a few others, I think most everybody here have some kind of uh, common uh, pull in that direction. Um, and, and, and money is nice if you can get it. Um, but I think I, <clears throat> I have to offer a great curiosity and building tools. I've uh, been a software developer for 25 years, trained in electrical engineering, um, and that may be more of a, a detriment than a, a plus knowing too much about things and not having a clue about anything. <laughs> but I do love to build stuff and, uh, and, and I'm making trails into some of the more advanced areas of, of developing and some of the new architectures of software. Um, it's, it's fascinating. I started with Lego when I was younger, and, and and here we go. So I'll just I'll just pass over to John. Um, and again, thanks. Really glad to you could make it. Good to have you here, Colin. So um, um, the the way kind of that I kind of see this is, um, I mean, I, I touched upon modular a couple of times. Let me explain a little bit of that. Modular kind of is two things for me. One if there would be kind of a modular approach towards, let's say, designing a learning environment, both in terms of an, an, uh, uh, a Facebook community uh, and also an app that goes with it, and then whatever middleware and protocols that would sort of need to sit in between, that would be one level of it. The other modularity is through design thinking that would allow everyone of us to weigh in with our particular expertise that would sort of basically make for a much better service and product than if anyone would just say this is this is the thing and then we would sort of everyone else would be sort of subcontractors in terms of ideas. Um, the third aspect of modularity is for the end user which is probably the most important aspect of it. If that would be modular uh, and I mean, I think there's a reason for why apps have grown so popular because you just download it and in a couple of minutes there it is, right? And you can sort of shuffle them around in your, your iPhone or in your Android phone and they just work. So, my suggestion is basically to just add a slightly different take on an app that would then sit comfortably in a smartphone. Namely, that app would then enable the user to get more value and meaning out of all the other apps as well as sort of being useful as an app in its own right and as a singular kind of standalone thing right from the start out of the box so to speak. Uh, this is I mean a formidable design challenge but once we would have some kind of a beginning core thing uh, the rest could be basically done mostly through uh, field testing and prototyping. I mean, this this is a story I want to tell you that that I mean Nokia now is kind of in the shambles and parts of them have been bought by Microsoft, I think. But in its in its glory days, 
Nokia had kind of a secret weapon against the foe than uh, Sony Ericsson. <coughs> and I happen to know about these things because these, I mean, I'm Swedish and so Ericsson was our pride and joy and we got regularly beaten by the Finnish Nokia, right? Uh, so anyway, one of the secret weapons was they kind of had a bunch of 12, 13 year old kids and they took prototypes and they handed it over the, to the kids and in their very upfront way they basically said kind of this sucks and then it was kind of back to the prototype lab right and the only other thing they said was this doesn't completely suck and then the Nokia engineers knew that they had a winner because this is kind of a typical kind of way of this completely suck or this doesn't completely suck so there were some things that, uh, they, that even the 12 year old kids thought was cool right and then it was all about shipping them out to the kids and uh, this is basically kind of a, the story that just conveys the, 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 the magic of prototyping if we would be uh, daring and courageous enough and humble enough to sort of eat humble pie from getting loads of young people to tell us that what you did just sucks a number of times we would eventually get it more or less right so people would begin to use it uh, and uh, between us we have possibly knowledge and intelligence and know-how so we could build a Rolls Royce of an app I mean this is dangerous as Mark has already said much better than I could so instead we should probably do two bikes a couple of two by fours and some duct tape so that would be the kind of the design approach so it would be look much less finished but the learners would know what to do with it and it would be kind of an added benefit to sort of them then would be able to sort of cobble it together directly on their smartphones and in the communities and there would be questions and questions and thousands of questions but I mean that w w that is what the community would be for so the community would be part uh, exchanging of, of insights shared, shared less lessons learned and so, such but it would also be a meeting place in between edge uh, educators teachers and the learners uh, and it, it, it uh, one of the powerful things with this approach is that it's it's so simple so uh, combined with some of the patterns that are already sort of gleaned and teased out of the conversation community I mean what makes for a good community and what makes for good conversations this precious little else we need uh, I mean we need to figure out some things I mean there's still kind of an ongoing argument whether uh, the existing educational institutions just plain suck and need to be scrapped uh, and if we just sort of need to obsolesce them or if there are some few salvageable parts here and there in kind of some countries, perhaps Sweden and, and, and some some other places. But I mean, those are eminent fodder for for conversation in their own right, right? I mean, the whole. John, uh, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop you right there, John, and pick yeah. up on a couple of points you made. They're yeah. really great points. You can't find a better model for a solution than your example of Nokia and Ericsson. Because when they handed those phones to the 13-year-olds, they went to the people they needed to, the experts. So that's a great model in many ways because really what you're asking the, the, the kids to own their own education. So that's a great model. Um, a second part of that is I think that one thing that makes it probably even more difficult, and you may be familiar with how it works in the States, but to put it in perspective, you know, Swedes, you, you folks are peace-loving people from the word go. You don't really want to fight about things. In America, we fight about everything, and education is something that we fight you know, pretty hard battles about. And the numbers are huge here. I live in a city that has 120,000 students in the public school system. So there's 120,000 kids that fall under this factory education umbrella in Charlotte, North Carolina. A million people in the city, 120,000 in the school system. In this city, we have between 12 and 15,000 people who homeschool. So the numbers here in the states and the size of this thing we call education make it, you know, make it more difficult. Um, you were talking about how Swedes at one time were number one. The Finns have overtaken the Swedes by some measures. And at the same time, South Korea is number two. 
but the difference between the Finns method and the South Korean method are night and day different. And so with, with all those pieces there, you still come back to big institutions trying to say how it's going to work, but when you go to your model of Ericsson and Nokia, you find that where it works is when it's personal. The kid can say, this is what I want to do. And when they talk about making an app and, or games, all of a sudden now technology has become the focal point because that's, what, that's the medium you're trying to make it work. Well, just as teachers become good teachers, they were attracted to the process that goes on in school, therefore they became their passion. They became teachers because they, that was their passion when they were young. They were raised up within that system. If that number is 10% of the population, then that's 10% of the population that fares well there. There's another group of kids that love gaming and they take it to the, you know, to the ultimate and they become a, co a coder and they become gamers. But gamers like technology. Um, a young girl that might like fashion, she doesn't care about technology. Technology gets in her way. So the focus can't, you know, whereas teachers teach and teaching is the focus, that completely misses the purpose of it's all about the learner. And if you talk about the technology too much and the technology becomes too much of a focus, you lose focus of what's important, which is the learner. And the learners right now that are using technology are using Instagram, they're using Twitter, they're using all these mediums, and they really don't care. They just are out there searching for something to do, and instead of searching for something to do to occupy the free time they have away from a painful school environment, that's where something has got to change to where they can find something that is not just a way of killing time. Yeah. Something that's going to lead them to a profession. And so again, if you talk about learning styles, I think if Griswold said there are 32 learning styles. There are a lot of learning styles, but there is one learning style that works for everybody with the exception of somebody that has a true learning disability. And I don't put ADHD in the category as a true learning disability. Everybody can learn by watching and mimicking and listening to other people and taking their hands and doing something, whether it's writing a story or building a cabinet or playing a game. The key is the doing part. Every, every one of us can learn by doing. Only a, a percentage of us can learn by reading out of a textbook or reading something online. But we all can learn by doing and then we can build on what we learn by doing by dropping back and reading. And we will all read better and read for content much better when we are reading about something that is personal and passionate to us that we relate to. But in the current environment, we're just all abstract learning. We're learning math for some purpose down the road. We will tell you about that purpose somewhere down the road. We're learning language arts, not so we can write a story about ourselves, but we're learning language arts so that we can pass a test and go to the next grade. Yeah. And so, you know, I think the focus, as people talk about these endeavors to try to make it better, one of the one that's most important for what you are so good at, John, is the communication, the conversation. That's what's so special about your, your group within Google Plus is it is about a conversation. It is about a dialogue. How do we have these varying viewpoints come together and peacefully talk about it? And that's the difference. Where you are, people can probably have pretty calm conversations about this. In the States, even in my own household, we can't have calm, calm conversations about this because it is it's such a lightning rod issue here in the States. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, th th this is. I mean, you touch upon so many important points. Let's see. I mean, one kind of thing that sort of popped into my mind when you talk about this is kind of the, the, the crucial uh, importance of, at least further on, to sort of close close the gap, close the circle. I mean, and societies, healthy, vibrant societies, need to uh, have good teachers in all kinds of sizes and shapes and forms. I mean, in mentors, uh, instructors, trainers, uh, teachers, academicians, what have you, researchers, um, uh, coaches, facilitators, uh, those need to uh, 
and the, the, the te many teachers I met are basically on to these things from ma many different directions and viewpoints, kind of figuring out how to sort of rekindle learning itself, kind of beyond the institutions. Um, and then learners need to also be helped taking those few extra steps towards uh, being accepted as sort of equal members in, 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 in society. So this for me, I, I'm, and this is sort of vastly simplified, right? So this citizens begets teachers, begets learners, begets citizens. So it's kind of a closing of the loop that needs to happen. One idea I wanted to throw out is that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm quite fond of the old idea of mentoring, where in the last stages of, of a learner's kind of learning trajectory, as, as, as a young person at least, there will be some kind of arrangement which could be coordinated and networked in, in these communities as well. Uh, so basically, someone who has unschooled or homeschooled, I'm not sure what the, kind of the correct term is, would then be accepted as, as finding a mentor. And that mentor would be, be kind of guiding that learner in, into some kind of gainful employment or entrepreneurship or startup or something. Uh, and this is something that uh, I think Andrew touched upon uh, John Hegel's book, The Power of Pull. And actually, John Hegel has written some really good stuff about mentoring and how mentoring could sort of be sort of rediscovered, rekindled, reapplied in a network centric context. So, mentoring is basically, um, I mean, it's a bit like a teacher, but it's a more kind of a hands-on, walking next side to and learning by doing, kind of rather than teaching. I mean, I'm not sure if mentoring is, means the same thing in in, 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 in in US as it means in Sweden. So feel free to sort of chip in here and kind of anyone. Yeah, John? Yeah. Mike, was it? Yeah? Uh, Brendan, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, the, I mean, the concept of mentorship is something um, I've been talking about with quite a few people on Google Plus and elsewhere. Uh, Mark Rose, etc. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's basically the model a lot of people are looking at, at as being what what needs to happen instead of this top-down learn what I'm telling you to learn. It's more uh, walking side by side, uh, helping people to learn. I mean, there there are a lot of ways you can do mentorship. I mean, that's one characteristic of it, but yeah, something that's less uh, institutional and more personal. Yeah. I, I think, think if, John, I, if I may remember correctly, I think uh, possibly he, John Hegel tried to coin the phrase co-mentoring, which I, if that is kind of, I remember correctly, is rather, rather nice because this is kind of reframing all in its own right, that, that the learner has as much to contribute as, as the mentor has to contribute to the learner. Uh, so th this um, is it, it, it's increasingly true. I mean, going back to my example with my 15-year-old who learned great presentations with using the tool Prezi, and he learned it in two days. Uh, so I mean, I would probably need to take a few lessons from my own son, right, in how to do Prezi presentations. Right. Uh, so then suddenly some of these roles and dynamics are reversed, and this is. Um, there's another angle in this. I want to sort of weave in Mike eventually if you feel up to it. That uh, this flipping of things, flipping of classroom structures, flipping of educational processes, flipping of of all the dynamics that are there, uh, possibly also holds for uh, diversity in between cultures, in between languages, in between gender, in between ages. So. Once we would sort of discover that this is a source of enrichment, this is a source of kind of increased co-creation of value. I mean, there's some consultants that I know of now in England that are kind of trying to work out business-friendly approaches towards co-creation of value, and they are right now out talking with, with young kids, and the young kids are telling the consultants what works and what doesn't. Uh, and this is, I mean really new. I mean, me as a consultant, I, I'm very much in the field of being paid for what I know and being the expert, right? So this is kind of a, 
um, kind of a challenge all by itself. But if this could be done, so if there's a more networked, a more diverse, a more flipped, reframed perspective, uh, suddenly a great deal of the things we could do. Uh, so instead of just saying, here's a, here's a little PLE app, we could then basically say, uh, we, are, we are helping building a better future for our kids and grandkids. Do you want to join? I mean, to be blunt about it, that value proposition I could sell. I mean, I, 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 I could present that in a way that would make it extremely uncomfortable and difficult for people to say no to me. So once we would have such a powerful value proposition, because value propositions is the kind of the language of businesses, right? You want to have sort of to get, let's say, initial funding, sort of kickstart this thing off. You would need to think about what would also make business sense. I could, for instance, go to policy people in Sweden and say, I could help you save a couple of million. Let me try this. And then I wouldn't sort of be just met with a blank stare. I, w I wouldn't just sort of be politely shown the door. They would listen to me. Uh, so these things I'm throwing in the, the mix because, uh, I mean, there's multiple paths we can choose here. I'm not just saying we you, you obviously have to go with the, 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 the business angle. I mean, I'm quite fond personally on the sort of the guerrilla tactic myself. I basically just design it, open source it, and then disrupt the whole status quo and then see what happens. So, I mean, there's, uh, I'm kind of mindful of um, all those many people who are right now sitting. I mean, one particular factor that came to mind. In, in the age group of 45 to 55 in US, all the people in that age bracket that can leave a big companies and big institutions are doing so. They are like rats from sinking ships, right? So there are there is already kind of a dynamic that works towards this from that angle as well. These are people who are being sort of hollowed out, downsized. The hollowing out of the middle class is is sounds like an abstraction, but it isn't. Uh, the if we could figure out a way to not only attract young people, but attract all the people who want to leave institutions and doing something different, then why not bring select parts of these people together? I mean, what, what I'm meaning with kind of um, finding the old people as well, because they have they have the experience, the expertise, the battle scars to prove that they're worth. Right? I mean, sorry, Mike, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was waving my hand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the old people too. Uh, let me take a a, a stab uh, here now, John. Uh, I was trying to get my bearings. I, I've been a lurker uh, for over a year now. This is my uh, G plus is my first uh, social uh, uh, or online <laughs> social uh, network. Um. But, yeah, let me do the introduction uh, just because I think you probably need that so you don't think I'm from Mars or, or can at least maybe decide that I am definitely from Mars. Um, I am trying to figure out if, if I have anything to offer the relevance um, for this whole educational dialogue that's been going on. I engaged, I, I got to know uh, about a year and a half ago, um, uh, well let me let me even go back from there. My background is the last 25 years, um, uh, actually 30 years ago, I, I lived, uh, started living with uh, an indigenous community in Papua New Guinea and they were probably 99, well maybe not quite that high, uh, well, no, 99% functionally non-literate and probably 90% totally non-literate in any language. Um, and I came in there with, you know, all my years and years of formal education. And, um, um, but, you know, try doing community development and translation and so forth and, and trying to 
help them to to grasp and take ownership of it, you know, act on behavior change, whatever you want to call it, life crucial information, things like giving babies rehydration fluid, um, or you know, <laughs> when they were, when they were, you know, had diarrhea, um, yeah. and I can tell you the stories about that, but but um, so you know, how far is that from where this conversation is? Um, but okay, let me try to hit a few things that you have actually touched on. Um, mentor, um, I at some point somebody introduced me to the concept of coach, and this may be a sort of a nuance, uh, probably is. But um, as a linguist, by the way, um, I I think that words are symbols that groups like us invest with meaning, shared meaning. So, um, which is very Saucerian if you're familiar with linguistics. Um, um, but, but, so I'll do it. Um, the difference is this, um, and I think it may be apropos to the kinds of things that, uh, especially Brendan, I know him as well or better than anyone in, in this group so far, um, touches on, is this. Uh, a mentor takes the higher position by almost by default. I know more than you. And see, now let me go back to something I didn't finish in my introduction. Um, um, I, when I had all the, these years of education, the breakthrough for me was when I said to these people who couldn't read or write, I need your help. Okay? Um, and I would... So out of that developed the whole concept of a shell. <laughs> uh, there was a fella at our computer center there in the Highlands at the time who had been a former IBMer, and he said, "Oh yeah," I explained the concept to him. You know, not a template, but a principled framework of key concepts. You know, and I illustrate this readily with, you know, look, I don't, I don't mean to disrespect your language or culture or who you are as an indigenous people group, but you know, hey, HIV causes AIDS, for instance, and having sex with a virgin will not cure you. You know, this is what I call life crucial information. Um, uh, so those types of things. But, but it didn't matter how well I could explain them or how well I could, quote, mentor people in, in those concepts. Um, they had to take ownership of it, and I had to say to them, I need your help. And so a shell is presenting the key concepts um, in a way that says, here, <laughs> let, let's talk about this, let's con converse about this, and that's a key part. If you know any of my uh, uh, background from my G plus profile, for instance, I, I worked with a guy uh, in 91, Ken Pike. Dr. Pike was... Uh, 15 times nominated for a Nobel Prize in linguistics on this whole way. We called it, we ended up calling it pattern oral paraphrase. Um, and <laughs> it, it is, and it was, it was pattern and it was oral, but it was conversational, if you follow me. That's the key point yeah, for you yeah. guys. Um, the, the, the key thing is that we had to come up with a way that they could take ownership of. And because they couldn't read or write, it had to be memory patterning, if you will. Okay? Mm. Here's the key concepts. Let's talk about them. But then at the end of the get day, you're going to have to say this. You're going to have to understand this. And then you say it. And then somebody who can write the language will write it down. Or you can record it or whatever um, uh, in terms of your own language and cultural perspective and take ownership of it and it is so powerful that was the breakthrough for me and I have to call it coaching as opposed to mentorship because um, you know you think about at least the um, uh, the concept I know is the USA guy is um, a coach is you know um, especially the older I get uh, I could coach these young people they're the ones they're so more gifted than I am just as these elders among the Kofi Apostle people were um, I couldn't do what they do but I could coach them 
in the things that I knew about. But in the end, if they didn't execute like a coach teaches the uh, the uh, the athletes, I guess um, the people they're coaching, whatever, and whatever they're coaching them, uh, the, the coach can't do very often. Certainly at my age, <laughs> and not knowing their language and culture, um, I I had to take that approach. I don't know if that's just nuanced to you guys or not. I mean, tell me. No, I, I think this the is mentor. The difference between mentoring is that I know though. what yeah. you need to know, yeah. which is still true in coaching, but it's more of this: I need you to do it. I can't do it. So yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, the the shell, the shell idea is kind of what I've been looking for in my kind of ongoing quest for social presence and social presence dictionaries and by, folk by the way, John, and yeah. John, uh, sorry, uh, just let me slip in there that uh, the the folks, the education people I've been hanging out with or started in, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Kim's course, Designing a New Learning Environment, last year, uh, uh, called it uh, uh, expert scaffolding and or specialist scaffolding. So, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, this scaffolding th word is a uh, word I'm, I mean, I could just say, so, so you get some context, uh, Let's see, where's the camera? I'm not sure if you can see any of this. I'm holding it closer. Uh, uh, hold it slow. Conversation led networking is all about making ourselves open to people and ideas. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is kind of me. This is kind of what I've been doing. This started as. Mm -hmm. um, it grew out of years of, of, of sessions with executives and leaders because they were basically very skilled at communication and stabbing each other in the back. They were really poor at conversations, mm -hmm. as if the others were people. I mean, it kind of is an occupational hazard, having <laughs> rise into the ranks in that way. <laughs> kind of, some of these guys, most of them are guys, turn out like that. So they paid me offensive amounts of money for having me coming in and help them rediscover how to talk with one another. So that was basically my day job for a number of years. And now I realized that, I mean, they liked me because I didn't judge them. I mean, I came in from left field and from, from mutual friends and, and very strange journey. I wouldn't bore you with those details, but suffice it to say that they, they liked me and they, they realized that some of the things I was doing was kind of bringing results, and that was kind of all they needed bringing. Now, I realized after a couple of sessions that there were recurring patterns. So immediately before becoming unstuck, immediately before kind of realizing, hey, we could talk with one another again. So there were these recurring patterns. I jotted them down and turned them into cards. Then I had a kind of a stroke of insight, and then I sort of showed these cards to them, so they could sort of begin to take ownership of their own sort of repatterning, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That was really powerful because then I was less of an expert and more of a coach and a facilitator. Now it was a bit embarrassing because one once they got hold of these cards, they asked me, "John, great stuff. Uh, do you know why it works?" And since this was kind of all born out of hands-on practice, I basically just had to come clean and say, no, I don't. <laughs> um, which led me on kind of many, many years of a quest because I had to sort of see, is this is kind of me wishful thinking? And did I just make this up out of thin cloth or what? So long story short, after a number of years and through delving through narrative and, and design thinking and sense making and God knows what else, uh, there is a methodology underneath. So one of the key concepts is uh, scaffolding. Mm. And one of the sort of, sorry for being a bit meta, one of the key concepts is the very idea of there is something called key concepts. Uh, I mean, I could just give you kind of from, from the previous uh, hangout I had earlier today. Uh, so there's a social presence dictionary that's kind of under production, so to speak, a kind of core set of words that would make for sh improved chat understanding. So three of the words that we're probably going to make it into the kind of beginning set is mobile, narratives, and ecosystems. Mm -hmm. uh, these words are nice because they cover an awful lot of ground. I mean, mobiles could sort of then be extended into tablet, uh, laptop, and what have you, kind of gadget, if you will, smartphone. Uh, narratives is plural for a reason. I won't sort of go into too much into that. Ecosystems is also important both in the actual ecosystem perspective and also in the metaphorical sense, kind of networks and, and, and social networks and so on. But the real beauty of these words is if you put them together, 
So then you would begin to see some very interesting patterns happening between mobiles and narratives, because mobiles are a way to access narratives, and narratives needs to be brought into better alignment with ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So then suddenly with just three words you have a story. Uh, so this is kind of what key concepts can do. And I already have the methodology. Uh, you could say that if, a uh, bit of a simplification, but if you have mobiles, narratives and ecosystems as the white keys on the piano, these um, cards, they are the black keys in between. Mm -hmm. So suddenly you can sort of play a whole number of different tunes and you can sort of connect in between the, the, the white keys and the black. I mean, it's not the best of analogies, but anyway. Uh, you could also say that in a more particular way when we talk about learning environments, which is the context of this hangout, you could say that if you have an agreed core set of key concepts, uh, you could then use this pattern languages are, that are underneath. I mean, these cards are just kind of the top of the, the iceberg, if you will. There's a whole bunch of stuff underneath. They could sort of begin to sort of tease out working patterns in between. So let's say there's, just to give you an example, just to give you two words, institutions and uh, networks. Or rather, better still, educational institutions and networked learning. Just have those two key concepts. Then we could use this personal learning environment and rig it so so all the learners would then also be able to figure out their own working patterns in between. This is kind of something that lies dear to my heart because I'm very fond of the expression baby in bathwater. Just because all the institutions are kind of a bit way beyond their expiry date and needs to be scrapped. It doesn't mean that all the people inside the institutions need to be scrapped as well. So mm -hmm. they need to be offered some kind of a transition from institutions to network, from one paradigm to the next, from mm -hmm. being more or less demoralized, disenfranchised inside existing institutional practices towards something that makes for a more thrival uh, livelihood. So this. Um, Obviously, we probably, if we would ever want to do anything with this, we would probably need to sort of focus in on something very small and concrete and tangible to begin with. But yeah, I mean, let me let yeah. me can I jump in there? John? Yeah, uh, just quickly because I'll I'll uh, lose my the the uh, thought. Um, I'm afraid um, uh, with the, with the concepts and then going I, where I think you're going with that now. But you tell me. Um, uh, the concepts I'm talking about are very small and concrete. Um, I, I had breakfast with a, a friend uh, recently who is a, 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 a works in a pharmaceutical manufacturing. He does quality assurance and works with people on the floor. And uh, there are certain, and this is true. Was it uh, Brendan? I think Don Arnoldi in one of our conversations somewhere way back when talked about the purpose of learning, uh, or at least one of the purposes of learning, uh, according to Don, was to join a, a, a professional community of practice, whatever that might be. And I, I like Mark Poole's emphasis, you know, let the learner determine, uh, you know, what that might be. Um, but anyway, there are certain things to be, to enter in, con key concepts, um, fundamental, let's call, maybe say that, uh, yeah, concepts, yeah. like with my uh, friend who, uh, at the pharmaceutical manufacturer, you know, uh, if you're if you're putting together a, you know, half million dollar batch of this or that, <laughs> you don't, you don't want to, if you're a floor worker, you may have some great ideas, and this was the balance for him. See, he wanted to learn from them, but not in the midst of a half million dollar batch. And he's yeah. a really neat guy in the sense of coaching what I was saying. He wants to get that feedback. He wants to have that conversation. He learns. He's valuable to, you know, the people who own this plant. And it's a major manufacturer here in our area, um, in the valley. Um, and he takes longer, and he's non-conventional. Mark, you would probably love him, <laughs> but but because he listens to the people on the floor, and he says, "Hey, that's how I learn." But 
going back to your point, John, the, the, the key concepts I'm talking about are life crucial or business crucial in, in his case. Um, life crucial in the case of HIV causes AIDS, having sex with a virgin will not cure you, sorry, don't mean to you know dis disparage your cultural perspective on that one, but this is a key concept that is actually true, and there's many others. You've got to give a, a, a baby who's, who's, who's got severe diarrhea, if you don't give them rehydration fluid, they're going to die, okay? And you could go on and on and on in every field every area of human endeavor and you get that. Now number one it's important because then you, you th this approach again saying I need your help. I don't know how to communicate this to you. We need to have a conversation. There's a principled framework I like to say that needs to be learned if th your goal is to engage or, or th in this uh, uh, professional community or to learn this topic but the beauty of it is, in our day and age, uh, remember I started this <laughs> 25, 30 years ago, uh, think about the technology back then that we started with. And I lost everything I owned trying to develop the shell technology, and we're slowly getting there. Um, but, but, but where we are now, it's possible to do this on an incredible scale, and I don't know how to transpose what I did with indigenous people, it's still incredibly important to half the people on the planet. And I feel like, you know, this voice in the wilderness or something trying to say, hey, to, to the educational communities, but I don't want to become a bore, so anybody can tell me to shut up here. <laughs> Doesn't work, it's not relevant. Mm -hmm. Is this, look, I don't know how these principles work in your world, but I know, I know, I know, I know that they work. And one of my great frustrations working with my programmers, I had a company and I lost control of it and smart people tanked it because they didn't get these key concepts. I know what needs to be done, but in in your, and I see, I listen to these uh, conversations, you know, I lurk lots and lots and yeah. lots and I'm not scared to open my mouth because, you know, it makes a, you know, it shows forth the fool that I am quicker in your world. Um, uh. <laughs> well, I could, I could reassure yeah, you, right. and everyone else lurking that would just sort of read this uh, or listen through this kind of thing, right? That uh, I, 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 if needs be, I would add a fifth rule to the conversation mm. community that will sort of explicitly say that there's no such thing as a foolish question or a foolish comment in the conversation community. There simply isn't. And uh, yeah, and if I need to enforce that, then so 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 so, so be it. And I mean I'm uh, but there's another really important thing with your fundamental uh, concepts idea and that is possibly uh, we could spend a couple of posts in, uh, exploring sort of the creative tension between uh, knowing and not knowing. Uh, that is a very very interesting creative tension to hold because my contention or my hunch rather is that there are some pretty fundamental questions to be found in between mm -hmm. the knowing and the not knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean I usually use some homemade coupled together version of this because sometimes I get too immersed in the kind of the the, the, the marketing dimension of the host this whole Google Plus machine. And then I feel like Charlie Chaplin inside modern times in the big <laughs> machine and you I mean you feel kind of it feels strange, right? I mean, I'm I'm best friends with the bloody algorithm, um, <laughs> and it, yeah, I mean, it really is weird, right? And I'm old enough to sort of remember the days, sort of before laptops, before smartphones, before cell phones, and before any of those, right? When when uh, life was simple, and I could sort of read uh, colored Batman and Superman magazines, and life was perfect. Now, uh, but back to the knowing and the not knowing thing. If we could discover the fundamental questions, then it would be a very, very powerful sort of core to start with. I mean, I started this whole kind of hangout with basically feeling out that we could start with four key verbs. And they, they, they are basically cribs from Stephen Downs. There's a whole lot of connectivist theory around it. But he basically suggests that start with four, these four 
ideas for a personal learning environment. Start with repurpose, aggregate, remix, and feed forward. Uh, now, the, the, the beauty of that is that you can sort of tell anyone in 10 seconds. And if anyone would ask, kind of, well, what's... Aggregate, I'm, I'm typing them down so I'll remember. Yeah, uh, I can say them again. Uh, repurpose, aggregate, uh, remix, feed forward. Now, what I would love to have is a set of 15, 20 questions, possibly no more, that would sort of provide uh, both the rich context which then could sort of be recontextualized because they're just questions. They could sort of be basically put in any which kind of language, right? Because they're just questions. And together, those questions combined with those kind of four, four, four keywords mm -hmm. would create kind of an emergent momentum all in its own right. Mm -hmm. So by grappling with them, there would be learning happening. So, I mean, the, the, we could always sort of complicate it and put... I mean, I really like the shell idea because I'm really fond of... Uh, I mean, let, let me explain this way in a very sort of hands-on way. See if I get mm -hmm. some... Uh, this is what, what could sort of be done. Oh, I lag in my video. There it is. So now suddenly you can see three cards. Now, they can be read in a sequence kind of the first card is kind of the beginning of the story and the middle one is the middle and the, the third one is the end of the story. It's the basic core archetypal beginning, middle, end of a narrative in a story. <laughs> and those cards are actually also designed so you can, uh, you can annotate them and then suddenly you have a story. Now, there's, an <coughs> there's another dimension to it. They also work, so card number one and three, they act as context, as a shell for the card in the middle. Mm. Uh, it makes for a very, very poor and crude and simple little sort of machine just by three, right? But but if you add to them and around them, you can create uh, these what I call uh, modular contexts, which doesn't sort of mean anything to most people. But I mean, to me, it's kind of a short way to describe that. Uh, you could take an existing working pattern in one context, for instance, in one culture. And once you have the pattern, you can transplant it, transplant it into um, a different culture, different context, and then you can sort of figure out what is the, the, the tweaks and the context that is necessary for that pattern to be useful in the different context. Mm -hmm. Can I cut in on you there, John? Yeah, sure, sure. It's it, one of the things I find with talking with you. It's a uh, it's a game of percentages because you've got a lot, <laughs> and I and I don't mind that. And it's very interesting that uh, we connected on one of your posts recently, where someone challenged how often and how much you put out there. Yeah. Um, and I think I have a bunch of notes here, but I think this is stuff that probably better belongs in posts because it's getting into details. I concur with a lot of things that have been said. Um, and the the idea where <clears throat> disparity, I think, is the one that I think is important in the in the context of it. And I think Mike spoke very strongly towards that. Um, I I often feel quite when I start to think about solving the problem from an engineering point of mind, I think of okay, well, I'm super 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 privileged. How would I do it if I was Mike? <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I, and I got a, I recently met a guy who worked as an immigrant worker with my wife and you know he really broke my heart because he was here for three quarters of the year making nubbins mm -hmm. so you know I've made a connection with him to find a way to get him to you know use this technology which is a new wave and if he gets on it's booming in Jamaica so you know, um, I'm just trying to mentor and coach and support him in not knowing what I'm doing, but knowing that there's better. And it's people first that makes a difference. And Colin, it's caring. You, Colin, you know what you're doing. You, I, 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 I got to believe. I, did, I think you said a while ago you've been an engineer for 25 years. Okay, right? Is that... Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going on my engineering skills so much because it's not the tool first. Um, I think Google is magic all on its own. It's context of of being aware that we can communicate to help each other, but do we yeah. have time while we're look but do we have time while we're looking for something to eat? 
and who's after me again, and you know what am I sick with, and and right. what is God yeah, mad yeah, at? Yeah. What what is God okay. mad at me about now? And 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 we all know education is key, but uh, you know can't just smarten up, and uh, you know yeah, right. it's uh, I mean, it, that, ment that, mentoring is everything. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, Colin, that that is also kind of add, adding importance and emphasis on why I sort of broached a kind of somewhat taboo subject. I mean, I was in a Facebook group and I was sort kind of forcibly frowned upon because when I said to that group, "Hey guys, you have brilliant ideas here. Why don't why sh you should package it and sell it?" And that was kind of a taboo, no, no thing. You couldn't sort of use the word "sell" in that group, right? So it's kind of for pa or me, not reading the the, the the American English codes, right? But the if there is such an artifact as business and markets, why not leverage and use it? Right? I mean, I'm not the perfect candidate for the job. I mean, I have not only one but two spectacularly failed startups in London behind me, and I badly survived the second one. But I mean, I also learned some really invaluable lessons, kind of what what actually works and what doesn't in in terms of scaling up business, value propositions, God knows what else, right? So uh, as long as there is a shared purpose, shared intention, shared understanding of what we want to do, then business for me is just another tool. Uh, and if we can p put together something and it's uh, Scalable and valuable and meaningful and, and, and presentable enough for, for, for sponsors to, to, to join and, and, and getting the whole thing to, to, to scale up. It, for me, the pragmatic bottom line of that means that then we can sort of more quickly reach more people. Uh, I it's, think it's I think um, I think it's uh, it's like layers, and I think you have described it well when you put up the post about. Uh, the cell phones and the mobile technology, and it's already here. Just if people knew the power of what they have, yeah. um, your themes, your themes come around and around and again, and um, it's it's been very powerful. Um, with this idea of layers, um, I think it's giving ahead, but it's almost giving back to the layer of privilege below you, because the people, if you've managed to get up the ladder a little bit higher. Those people look at you like, well, why not me? And once that gets four or five levels apart, you're into that movie in time, and you're, you know, you just you just don't know that world. We're in a, a very interesting place where where John's brought together people who have that ethical desire to build something better and to be calm about trying to express that. And um, it's the tools are so scattered, you can. You know, I've got I've got 12 posts on paper. I got notes. It's like, how can we manage this operation? And it's almost like slowing down to realize that we only need these three words, this common message. But there is no common man. There is no common context. There is no common belief. There is nothing common. But what we do have in common is survival. And if we can throw away all the uniqueness as um, our different flavors, we can uh, concentrate on the, the job at hand, which is trying to survive ourselves. Um, but I don't even think half the people even know there's a game. And me being privileged to say, hey, buddy, I can help you not have to come back to Canada again and you know miss your family for half a year. Like, what, what the hell do I know how to do? So, you know, we're working at it. Um, yeah. And he... I talked to him every day, showed him how to use Google+, Plus, got him set up. He's uh, Dougie Jamaica and uh, Doug, Dougie Reed. And um, once he went back to Jamaica, he just, poof, he's got like dial up, he's got like bare feet again. It's like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, the, the, the um, a couple of practical kind of points that we probably need to start with a small group. We probably need to start with a very, very uh, small, simple prototype that could be done kind of in a matter of weeks uh, before the kind of initial enthusiasm wanes, so to speak. So using the kind of momentum and there's a prototype already. Uh, the, there's quite a wonderful thing that 
uh, I've also discovered in the conversation community. I mean, I had this kind of a stroke of genius in February, March of this year when I basically threatened to throw everyone out. And, and probably the best thing I ever did. And, and, and I got... I mean, I, I was very nice and Swedish about it, basically, kind of, if you want to sort of continue to be a member of the conversation community, please consider actually participating in the conversations. It's kind of a fairly simple thing, right? Now, that allowed me... Uh, that, that gave me the opportunity to give enormous amounts of feedback because people basically told me one thing. They are everyone is leading fragmented lives, everyone is frantically busy, there's at any time there's 15 different digital platforms that we need to be on, like Facebook and Twitter and Google Plus and email and this and that. And it sort of eats up our lives. And then we need to sort of be very skilled and, and smart in terms of marketing our stuff. And then it's kind of an ongoing battle because everyone else is also growing increasingly smart in marketing our stuff. And then we kind of, everyone is standing on our own kind of little shout box and saying, buy my stuff. And kind of, yeah. Uh, fun little game we're playing, but uh, if I mean what I did with, with that feedback is I basically rejiggered the whole conversation community. I, I changed some topics, I changed my approach to threads, I changed this and that. So the thing with me is that uh, if I face an impossible challenge, impossible problem, that has basically never stopped me. This is kind of how I, I do things. And this is where um, I can give you a bit, little bit of background so you can sort of put my me into context as well. So kind of maybe that helps. Uh, I was sort of expected to uh, study Russian and French classics by the age of five or six years old. I was expected to play the classical violin by the age of eight, and I drew architectural blueprints by the age of nine. Now. This isn't boasting. On almost on the contrary, this is kind of, kind of to give you kind of a, the, the personal context for me that I grew up in a very very unswedish and very highly dysfunctional family. So I spent a good part of my youth years to basically get away from that really weird stuff. But I mean, it's for me, it's it's a bit too late, right? I I, I have already from then, kind of a, a brain the size of a small planet. So I I know stuff. Uh, too much stuff. Now, so the 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 the, the recent the second half of my life up till now has been a way to kind of go back to that older dodge, honor thy father and thy mother, and for me that was really a battle because they gave me that sort of highly dysfunctional upbringing, and now I have decided later on to to, to actually honor that and making something good out of it. Uh, I mean, for me, it was an obvious choice, right, to become a consultant because I knew three times more than anyone else on the planet, so it was an easy game for me to play. But lately, I've sort of come to the realization that what if I make something else out of it and basically go to where not pr predominantly what I know best or what I know most about, but rather where's the most pressing need? for some select parts of my stuff and how could that be further leveraged by uh, networking combine that with others and I mean the rest you know the conversation community and all that so um, uh, I mean my, one of my sisters who's possibly even more clever and knows even more stuff than I do she sort of got unlucky so she ended up being member of parliament in Strasbourg in the European Union so we are a fearsome bunch, all of us, uh, not to be trifled with. But I'm really trying to behave. So when I met that, uh, encountered that conversation right yesterday, when basically uh, Sakari Marin said, John, you post too much stuff, that was really valuable feedback. feedback. So that was not me being cute. Now, I really appreciated that feedback because people like me uh, really need to get sort of really great feedback. I mean, I know tons of stuff, I'm a gas bag, there's basically no way to shut me up. But I do appreciate very, very much when people say, John, please give it a rest a couple of times. I, I need to put some words in edgewise, right? So, but the thing is, um, what I most would want to do given that I kind of can quickly synthesize and translate in between different expertises and fields and domains 
right here on the spot with you guys is that let's just design and build this app already. I mean, I already see how it could be done, but I need to pace myself because everyone else needs to be brought up to speed and being offered a seat at the place at the table, so to speak. This this is kind of the downfall of me. I see I'm, I see this already, and it sort of kills me that I already see how it could be done. Uh, so uh, this is where I need your help, really, to make this happen in a speed and in a manner, in an approach that is actually win-win-win for everyone. And the third win is, or rather the first win, is for everyone not present in this hangout, but rather all the others, kind of the end users, the young learners and so on. Disenfranchised, if you will. Okay, John? so, yeah, sure, sure. John, just go one quick one. I'm going to have to go in a few minutes. It's almost 4 o'clock here, and I've got to run somewhere. Um, I just want to plant this... Uh, uh, not for this one because I, I don't even have time to stay for very long, maybe a few minutes past four, and discuss. But it's this that, um, let's see, one of the things that's been the most difficult, not only for me, but I know it's even more difficult for, you know, the people that I work with all over creation um, who are, you know, not only indigenous, but, you know, people in major languages as well, is is um, in this environment, uh, the, the dialogue environment on, on G+, which I love. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on any of the others. I have a Twitter account, but I rarely ever use it. Um, it, it is, uh, and Brendan touched on this recently, and you, maybe, the, the, the finding something from five months ago, which was really valuable, um, and bringing it back in. Okay. Um, I think there's a connection, but I don't know exactly how to do it. Uh, it's certainly not in the Shellbook technology that, that you know, we developed back when. I mean, we started developing it in 2002, so, you know, it's, a, it's pretty old stuff, even though it's being used all over. Uh, it's not what it needs to be now, but it's this. In a shell... I've been told that the most valuable thing is the fact that every, and for multiple reasons I wouldn't even have time to go into right now, uh, everyone has an identity in shell book. It, it, everyone is a publisher, if you will. Okay, <laughs> and, and what happens is it's, it's a derivative works management system. That's the concept behind it. And you know, uh, Colin, if you get your head around this, you probably, uh, people like you who, who deal with software would, would know. I'm already talking to some now again. I think we're going to try to open source the technology. It's the pedagogy or it's the manner of relating. It's important. But, okay, in a derivative system, uh, Colin, I'll throw a few things in here. It's, it's a, it, we developed it in 2002 as a Java database app. You create, you publish a prime edition. Somebody creates this framework, okay, the shell, publishes it, quote, just punches the button, publish, and then can release it, and anybody else on the planet can create a derivative work, and it even has a genealogy tab in it, uh, you know, where you can see, and you can create gazillions of derivatives. We've got the Ethnologue database, which was our purpose, remember, I'm not, this is not I don't even know if it's relevant, if it'll fit yeah, somehow. Yeah, I, I, it, it's, it's perfectly it's relevant. relevant. It, sounds, it, sounds it sounds like a bunch of uh, uh, recursive cloning going on. Am I correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, don't, it has inheritance. It has inheritance at the object level, Colin. And well, send me, send me the links. You don't have time. I, I've been down okay, this yeah. rabbit hole before. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I also need to sort of cl close down this in a couple of minutes and just offer everyone kind of a short kind of just... Uh, Closing something. I mean, I, I would just f feel back to you, Mike, because this might be important. And, and I love to sort of continue this asynchronously in conversation community posts and, and, and what is needed. Uh, I've been talking in another project, and we came from a very different direction. And we basically arrived at what might be possible to basically what is kind of a working title for now uh, GitHub for Cultural Code. Okay, uh, the guys who are going to do it, the, 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 the people that I'm talking to, want to. we're talking about porting the uh, 
all this shell book and the shell book online. There's actually two projects onto GitHub. So yeah. is that related? Yeah, it's it's very much it's eerily resonant and on so many so, so many levels. I mean, the inheritance, the the using of, of people's sort of existing uh, know-how in terms of GitHub, the very robust framework in terms of, of fork and merge, the mm -hmm. commit, the whole thing, and and yeah. the whole thing just works, right? And it, it's kind of just a proven existing technique, which then can be be, be tweaked. I mean, I, I I would probably go on to at least two three more hours to use all the touch points in the team personal learning environment. Well, let's do it again. So so let, let, let us let us get back to that and basically dedicate the next hangout on getting down to brass talks in terms of of, of the the GitHubification possibly. Of okay. this PLE thing, right? So it's, uh, and and with that, I'm goes basically going to say, big thanks for what I consider a very delightful hangout, yeah. uh, and leaving the table for for everyone to to, to say whatever closing things you want. Bye, everybody. Same thing. Take care. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks much. Thanks. Thanks. I, li I like where it opened. I like where it opened. My daughter told me one time when I was trying to teach her just a little bit of something. She says, Dad, can't you make it interesting? <laughs> it only gets worse, uh, Colin. I've got 15 grandkids now, and, and uh, it's, it's a circus. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again, John. Thanks. Thanks. Great to see you all. Uh, yeah, th thanks for the hangout. And uh, I mean, I can think of a couple of follow-up uh, kind of threads to go off on. Uh, I mean, on future hangouts, uh, one is just how to utilize whether the, the app you're talking about or other other tools to facilitate uh, conversations and and learning in, in different respects. Uh, because I don't know, I think some of that could be pursued with creating video-based. Uh, whether it's conversations or uh, produced videos or whatever, I mean, people need to be introduced to the tools uh, and kind of how to use them. Yeah, particularly Ren, and what what uh, what you and I probably also need to sort of uh, look into a bit deeper is a whole lot of your threads, which I've been reading now, and they are great. Where you're participating in in Ross Hussin's threads and in Laura Gibbs' threads and in your own threads, uh, they are great outlines already. Some of your thoughts and some of your mus musings and reflections on some of the patterns that would make for a great uh, learning environment already. Uh, this is, I mean, I could go into detail, but I mean that would take too long. But I mean the Sin, uh, how to put this in a very short way? Uh, some of your uh, comments are very cardy, uh, and, and the simple explanation for that is kind of all those cards that I have, the sort of whole the methodology. They once grew out of conversations, so so the, there's there's much more to be said here. Kind of the, there's a metacognition angle to it. There's a learning to learn angle. There's a, a, a pattern thinking approach. There's a design thinking approach, and, and all those, if we might pull that off, could converge into something that would actually be very, very simple to use. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's key. Yeah. I mean, th this is. Um, I mean, this is kind of the reason for why, uh, why they look like this. Right. They they, they once were. Ten times as complex and complicated, and I just took away everything but the sort of the access point to the whole methodology, and then it sort of it unfolds once you sort of begin to to, to add stuff. So it, it this is actually a, a a learning methodology that is used to 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 in kindergarten levels, where you, as a skilled kindergarten teacher instructor, uh, uh, present stuff. That sort of catalyzes what is already inherent. Um, so all those cards are designed to work as catalysts. They they tr basically trigger conversations because they are designed so they are presenting almost the full story. 
but not the full story. And then the, the brain almost automatically adds uh, uh, the remaining stuff. And then once the brain is allowed to add the remaining stuff, there's ownership already because it's your own stuff inside your own mind, inside your own brain. Uh, and uh, there's an empowerment quality to it, there's a democratization process to it because it's just the patterns. Very similar to how GitHub is in itself fostering a particular uh, the code of conduct among programmers. Um, so uh, I, I probably need to stop there because I go on in a kind of a lengthy ramble about GitHubs and, and, and stuff. Um, you could basically say simplify that fork merge is a successful codifying into practice which is basically just fork is divergence which allows for creativity when you code and then if because if you, you then also need to merge it back you have convergence right so um, you could use uh, the method cards I've shown you in a very very similar way so it's just that I've expanded it a bit it is kind of basically uh, gather diverge uh, emerge converge and prototype but it, it's just a, a small tweak collaboration on, on what is basically the already proven working uh, github formula uh, and the, all the other stuff around in the github is basically to um, simple yet flexible enough modular uh, affordances so you can sort of crank out code using it um, and the step isn't all that it, it's not that big a leap actually from code to cultural code so you could say that the, the, the deliverable of learning is successful uh, cultural code or rather the successful appropriation of a unique set of cultural codes that makes for a, a good li good and successful and thriveable livelihood um, so uh, this is kind of what I mean with the kind of the closing the loop from a learner towards kind of making his way successfully into uh, society uh, and right, uh, yeah it's a, yeah. it's a key thing it is. I mean, it, it's. Um, so I was very happy to have Mike there because in, in, the, in the hangout because uh, he has found key concepts, principle, frameworks, scaffolding, coaching. Uh, basically, the si very similar key concepts that I found, although we have come at it from very, very different directions. And this is in in itself kind of anecdotal proof of there is a kind of some pattern language underneath. I mean, mind you, I've been borrowing freely from, from uh, Christopher Alexander, who is an architect. So he's using a very similar approach to build houses. So this is kind of the... the, the uh, so what I'm doing, what Christopher Alexander is doing with houses, what, what uh, Mike Trainum is doing in, in anthropology, giving voices back to, 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 to people. Uh, it's similar pattern languages underneath and and they are what makes for very um, uh, powerful translation in between domains so again this is hopeful that made some context on kind of that when I said that some of your comments are sort of cardy they are they already contain some of the the, the, the patterns we need Oh, yes. th th thanks for that uh, amplifying of the quote, Andre. I mean, really, really good that you could join us. And, and uh, uh, let's see. Uh, next, next on the agenda, um, should we find time for would next week work? Ah, uh, yeah, that sounds good. Cool. I mean, this is recorded now, so we can sort of go back and, and see if there's possibly some. So um, I'm very happy we got to the uh, the GitHub thing um, because um, we could basically look at GitHub and 
um, just take out some beginning small parts of it. I mean, we don't need to call it uh, fork merge. Obviously, we could call it something else. But this is basically the the, the um, um, at its simplest, learning has basically just those two things. Once one beginning thing is curiosity, you kind of open up a, a kind of a problem discovery phase where you kind of need to go wide and sort of to to to, to get as many perspectives as possible for your learning. Um, challenge, objective, task, something, whatever you want to learn. Once you've done that, you also need to, to codify it. And the codifying needs to be happening at least three levels. One is the kind of cultural thing. So the thing you've learned needs to then be, you need to be able to communicate that, to kind of to showcase your skills, your talents, so to speak. Another thing that is kind of still a bit lacking is that you also need to embody it into you yourself, into your, yourself as a living story. So, uh, otherwise if you sort of gather stuff, kind of uh, anything kind of that is kind of, you could learn but it's, it's actually not for you to learn, uh, then it would be just be some useless stuff inside your head, right? It would be, be kind of too much of it. Uh, and that is kind of the bane of, of the academic world, basically where people kind of suddenly find themselves in, in silos in ivory towers and they know tons of stuff about most everything but precious little of it is of use. Uh, so it's a very real um, um, danger, a very real risk of sort of doing that. So the embodiment is, is key. And the third one is um, kind of a new um, codifying which is the transition from institutions to network, which requires a different way of, of codifying. So, uh, in the old days, the codifying was that you sort of you crafted your your own little turf, your own little ivory tower, your own little secluded expertise niche, and that was kind of what br brought the big money. You were the expert. Uh, in a network-centric view, the only th way the, the only way that knowledge actually makes sense is if you share it. Uh, so it's a kind of a new set of codes, really, uh, and this is also difficult. I mean, this is where the best learners right now among the young are those who get the least recognition and the least traction for what they know because they're already operating in a paradigm that is not rewarded in by kind of the old institutions. Uh, so. But once we have sort of figured out how to do this, then um, the rest is just hard work and logistics. I mean, this it's such a th simple thing, really, that uh, you have a set of learning affordances that, 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 that makes for, for divergence. I mean, sufficient divergence. I mean, you could call it sufficient creativity also, if you will. And once you have that, uh, you have kind of kick-started the... the the absorbent mind, as Maria Montessori would call it, then it's convergence, a codifying into um, sort of the culture codes that make for a successful job, if you will, or a, or a company, um, the, the the successful embodiment. As it goes all the way back to eudaimonia, the, the kind of the happy life. That what you have learned and what you're doing, then on top of that is kind of what makes for what is meaningful for you. And the third level of code is, is um, well, it's a difficult one because it's kind of in transition from institutions to networks. Uh, I mean, the patent approach enables us to pull this off because this is kind of, with these patterns, you can um, quickly build stuff and then others can can tweak. So the fully modular approach allows others, I mean hopefully there will be learners who are even m more uh, clever than we are and then they can sort of see, that, yeah, why don't we do this? And then it's going to offer a tweak to sort of how to further evolve this. So that Mark Poole brought up a really, really important consideration that is kind of uh, the, the modular open access nature of the framework itself. 
which then can sort of be further tweaked, annealed, augmented, evolved, developed. Uh, and since sort of the GitHub thing is already kind of accepted in the, the cultural space, it's kind of already there, then we will probably be able to get away with kind of doing uh, different versions of it, sort of a cultural, a learning, a learning environment clone of GitHub, if you will. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm still thinking of like how how this will be sort of sold to people. Like a lot of times, it's hard to even get people to use Google Plus, which is which offers a whole bunch of learning environment tools and everything. Yeah. Because they're familiar with some other platform or whatever. I mean, likewise, people are on Google Plus, but not elsewhere. It's the whole fragmentation thing, and so that's something to keep in mind or consider how to invite people onto new platforms and even into new ways of thinking about learning. I mean, that's that's a core thing I'm kind of thinking about. How to sort of introduce some way, of these concepts like metacognition and mentorship. Yeah. Andrew? I, I think one way to help attract people would be to, uh, to gamify the, the process of, uh, of learning. Um, so high scores or things like that. Um, you try to beat the high score of... Uh, your, your own high score or compete with other people um, to learn new things. So there's a, there's a gamification aspect and then even the reputation. If you look up a reputation that you've learned such and such knowledge or skills, then that can change your uh, employability uh, outlook for uh, employers. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I I've taken a couple of cues here from, from, from my 15 year old and he He's playing a game, and he sort of reached to the top, and then there was an option to sort of uh, lev level down, so to speak, start all over, all over again. But then there was this, this badge that sort of told everyone else that he was on round two. So he had voluntarily sort of, sort of yeah. rebooted himself, but it still showed as a badge, right? He kind of was on, a, on the second iteration of the whole, sort of all the levels. Uh, now... What we could possibly do is to look for, uh, from an end user perspective, what makes for people wanting to, to uh, use it, uh, what makes them uh, use it more than other existing apps and tools out there, uh, what makes for meaningful modifications and tweaks and hacks. So this could turn out that the very uh, process of, of, uh, of, of um, hacking and claiming and tweaking the tool as your own version, that could sort of be gamified. So then in a community, let's say, there's someone who's already expertly modded his own personal learning environment and he would be recognized by his peers as having done so. So then a kind of yeah. a very simple badge system could then show that, yeah, this is a guy, he, he has quite a large ne network, uh, so that will kind of take care of the kind of the, the, the social aspect, right? Because he's a great network, so he's probably a decent guy in a social sense, right? I mean, it's just a crude proximetric, but anyway. And also, if then that will be added as a badge that says that he knows his stuff, he has spent a couple of hundred hours to, 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 to design some really good stuff that sort of fits very snugly together, then... I mean, if I would be a newbie in that community, that would be a guy that I would try to approach and sort of learn a thing or two. So uh, it could be sort of done very simply, and and it could be done sort of it's kind of inflow. So the way to sort of to to, to game the thing and rise in in, in popularity and and, and 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 skills would be to kind of to further build and tweak and modify and and improve the the the, uh, the tool, the framework, the app itself. I mean, this is kind of a bit of a challenge because then we need to sort of build a whole meta game inside it tool. I mean, it can be done. Right. Yeah. This. I mean, this reminds me of a uh, thread from a while back from George Station uh, about this sort of game layer augmentation called Just Press Play. Um, I can put a link here, but I mean, it's a long thread, but it's something to look at. It's related to this idea of um, applying game mechanics to. Learning environments and so on. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I want to sort of just put in, in, in before we, we, we quit, uh, that uh, the whole Google Plus environment is in a way kind of an infinite game uh, where there's just three dynamics at play. And two of them are kind of mostly invisible. Two of them are basically just, the first dynamic is curiosity. I mean, when it sort of opened up, we had to join, right? Because we were curious. And then the second dynamic that sort of keeps us here is that since there's one billion accounts in Google+, Plus, it would we would probably not be able to, 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 to endure kind of not knowing what goes on if we would just sort of leave the whole platform to the power of the double negative, so to speak. And the third dynamic is the plus button. So if you sort of take away and, and, and remove all the kind of non-essential stuff, which is basically just code and affordances and gizmos and nice things, it's just those three. So the curiosity and the power of the double negative and the plus button. So this means that the, I mean, you could argue about the finer details, but you can't argue with the popularity and the, the rate of adoption. There's one billion Google Plus accounts. And not all of it is, is, is thanks to, to Google's great name, right? I mean, it, it's it, it, this appeal to there's some really clever game designers and user experience, user interface designers in Google that sort of concocted this mix. So this this we could basically steal the user interface and the user experience and turning it into something really really simple. So we have. I mean, curiosity for the learners that is given. I mean, now we're saying, hey, it's an open source thing where you can sort of uh, improve your personal learning environment, and you can basically be, uh, improve your learning. The curiosity is taken care of. The power of the double negative is a different thing. Before that happens, we probably would need some uh, success stories, some case studies, some some people who are already kind of thriving by using it. Right, I think that's key, especially since the double negative can keep people on other platforms. I mean, yeah, a lot I mean, of people... I mean, but one, once there's a bunch of young kids having really great conversations with some old stogies like me, and we're talking about learning and kind of taking kind of learning to the next level, so to speak, and we need to use those metaphors to be in a very simple way, communicate something very, something very powerful. Uh, and then we need to figure out a third affordance as well. What is our equivalent of, of the plus button? I mean, it could be some kind of peer rating. It could possibly be kind of two buttons. One, rating someone, basically it's, 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 it's good stuff. And the other could be rating it for... Um, that it sort of adds to, to, to learning the whole thing. Um, so it would be kind of one button for, for the social dimension and one for the learning dimension. I mean, you're sort of feeling these out. It doesn't possibly need to be two, but I mean, if we could get away with one button, that's great. But I mean, as simple as possible, but not simpler. John, have you heard of the uh, Choose Your Own Adventure books? Sure no, I have. haven't. No, no, you haven't. Okay, um, so it's you uh, have these little passages of the book and then you get to the end of the, the little um, the little subsection of the book and then it will tell you two or more choices. Uh, you, you can make the choice for the characters in the book and then it will tell you for whichever choice you make that you want to make uh, to turn to such and such page and then you start again on the, on the rest of the um, character's journey through the story. Um, so to connect that with uh, a learning platform I think it would be interesting to explore the possibilities of um, uh, letting a learner um, choose their own path. I know Khan Academy is doing that a little bit, but to yeah. explore that further would be interesting. Um, so that you, you, you have the platform guiding the user, guiding the uh, student, but not controlling the path that they take. Uh, so to reduce the, reduce the size of the mod modules, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, that, you that, can choose already on, on these websites um, what course you want to take, but they're, they're huge modules. If you could reduce the size of the modules so that you can uh, more, more fine-grain choose uh, exactly what you want to learn and um, 
how you want to learn it. That would be cool. Yeah, I, I think okay. we could we could actually design one of those as kind of sitting inside, of the, for instance, and in, and in, in the learning community, right? So then it would be kind of reason for everyone to to keep coming back. I mean, the the key reason for why I'm coming back into Google Plus, for instance, is kind of I need to to, to put more stuff in the conversation community and in my Google Plus kind of public stream, right? So this this is kind of, in a way, this is my kind of choose my own adventure, I kind of choose my own um, Google Plus kind of ongoing story, right? The the blogging thing. So we could actually have choose your own learning journey as kind of an ongoing stream thing going on. Right, definitely. I think that's uh, sort of a key key part of what, yeah. what needs to happen, basically. Because then you could choose some of your added stuff in that choose your own learning journey thing, which would be very similar to choose your own adventure. Uh, some of them would be social, kind of just feeling out, connecting with others, hearing if someone has done this or learned that, or uh, is this solved already, or should I ha give it a go? Exactly. Um, yeah. That's that's the next thing I was thinking where I was going to go with that is adding sort of a um, a fictional layer sort of the science fiction layer to it where the students and teachers, whoever, uh, the users on the platform would be able to create their own fictional uh, stories and so you could, you could come up with these these ideas about, um, uh, they, they wouldn't even have to be prototypes, it could just be a narrative, you know, with these yeah. what-if scenarios of the future um, sort of testing out the possible social landscapes um, given uh, given certain um, changes that could happen yeah. to society. I mean, th this is wonderful that you say because I mean if you want to uh, um, anytime you want you could basically do a search inside Google Plus and then you could go search for, for Keldon and 2036 so I put some of those out where I basically sort of put myself in the future so some of my blog posts are basically pure fiction. I'm just pretending that I'm putting myself in the year 2036 and then I'm reporting back to here what has happened already. Now, th there's a deep reason for this. I mean, I my mantra that kind of underpins everything I do is basically just three uh, small kind of sentences. And that is kind of, uh, we made it, question mark, what happened, question mark, we happened, full stop. So that's kind of my whole thing. That's kind of the, my whole philosophy, if you will. And that is kind of, in a way, a play because it's kind of situated as if I can sort of look back from where we have already made it and then I'm looking back and see basically what happened. So this is kind of, uh, I'm calling it reverse imagineering. I mean, the, the big trouble isn't if we go extinct as a human species. The big challenge is, because I mean then it will all be solved right, one way or the other if we go extinct and then end of story. The big challenge is that it, what if we make it? What if it's possible to create a long boom? And this was just kind of some funny preamble stuff to what's kind of what, what was the major event. And that major event is something that we are preparing right now but big chunk of it is something that we really don't know. So um, the, 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 the science fiction part and narration part is, have, have you guys seen uh, Cowbird, which was started by Jonathan Harris, an artist? No. It's basically a site where people can just upload their video and telling their story. And it became no. massively popular because it's so simple, right? Here's a site Ah, you can upload your video and tell your story. That I mean, uh, that is the full description of the whole thing. So if we could, could sort of come up with here, here's an online community, you can uh, add stuff that you want to share with others about your learning journey. Done. So I mean, obviously we need to. Because that would basically just be divergence, right? So it would need to sort of have something that would make for convergence. And that's where the GitHub thing comes in. Where possibly there are kind of the GitHub architecture that sits in there somewhere around which there's, again, those layers, the shells that, that what my trainer said, 
so one of the shells is obviously uh, um, uh, online community itself. Another shell is the narration part. Um, a third shell is the kind of the the, the modding by users. Uh, but th all those are kind of already done. So 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 designers know already how to do these things. Um, yeah. Could you could you borrow the the peer review process from academia and apply that to um, to fictional works so that uh, the community could could um, review the these ideas that people have in, in these works of fiction and then um, possibly test out the the favorited ideas in real life. Are the ones that get the most votes? Yeah, I mean, the, the both uh, both Quora and Storyfy are already doing very similar things. Storyfy for stories and Quora for, for questions and answers. So, so all, all these all these technologies already exist. So the, my my main uh, angle on this would probably be to sort of do it as simple as possible. Because I mean, there there are there are bad designs as well, also. I mean, uh, cloud, for instance, is just the algorithms is base, basically rubbish. It's 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 really bad stuff. I mean, obviously, it's a fun game for those who want to play the cloud game. But I mean, as an algorithm, it's really really bad. Storyfy and and Quora are got have gotten it mostly right. Uh, Medium, the 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 one new blogging platform which Ev has started, the, the, the one of the uh, t t Twitter founders. They are looking into uh, total time. Total time reading, I think, is the key metric, which is kind of very interesting little metric. To, then you can see what content people actually want to spend large amounts of time actually reading, because the, this is this is invaluable, right? If you want to add learning content in, then you can sort of quickly figure out automatically. What parts are? I mean, there's a difference. There's some of the content people say that they like, and out of that, there's a smaller percentage w w which is they really like and find really useful. So, uh, but th there's a couple of these things we can sort of do, play with and sort of figure out what what would make for the, both a simple and very uh, powerful uh, platform. You did ask for spelling. Spelling which? Uh, did I miss something here? I didn't catch. I didn't quite catch that name of the the website. Ah, the cowbird thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'm. Signing off now, but I mean this has been a really great hangout, and and uh, let me just go to do quite unceremoniously.